If you watch just about any video about fundamental physics, you'll be told that there are four known fundamental forces. Gravity, electromagnetism, and two nuclear forces. You'll even be told how strong they are. What if I told you that those videos only tell you part of the story? Sounds like it's time to do a deeper dive. In books and articles about frontier physics, it's entirely common to be told of four fundamental forces. Gravity was the first to be understood, and it keeps us firmly on the ground and guides the planets through the heavens. Electromagnetism is a blend of electricity and magnetism, first really understood in the 1800s, but it also explains how light works, as well as playing a key role in chemistry. The strong nuclear force is the one that holds protons and neutrons together in the nucleus of atoms. Without the strong nuclear force, the only element out there would be hydrogen. And, of course, there's also the weak nuclear force, which is frequently mentioned as being responsible for some radioactivity. I made a video that explains why that's only part of the story. The link is in the description below. When authors and video creators list the forces, they order them in terms of how strong they are. The usual list says that the strongest of the forces is the strong force. If you call the strength of the strong force to be the basic unit, we can say that it has a strength of 1. Then, each in turn, we say that the strength of electromagnetism is about 0 0.01, the weak force is about 10 to the minus 5th power, and gravity is the paltry 10 to the minus 40 power. And that's the story we tell. Of course, if you think about it for the tiniest moment, you realize that this simple statement is utter hogwash, or at least it's an incomplete telling of the tale. After all, you've lived your entire life, and unless you're a physicist, you've never encountered the strong nuclear force, and you have plenty of experience with gravity. Your day-to-day -day experience tells you that gravity is way more important than the strong nuclear force. So what's the deal? What it boils down to is that the different forces have different behaviors. The way that the strength of the forces change with distance isn't the same. To illustrate the idea, suppose there were two hypothetical forces, one that is very strong for close distances but gets weaker for long distances, while there is a second force that is weaker at short distances but doesn't change. In this situation, one force is stronger than the other at short distances, while the other is stronger at long distances. You can't say which one is stronger without more information. For the list of strengths I mentioned earlier, the distance that was chosen is about 10 to the minus 15 meters, or a femtometer. That's about the size of a proton, which is, of course, super, super small. But it's the size at which particle physics experiments are done, so it makes sense. Let's talk about each force in turn. Let's start with electromagnetism and gravity, because both of these forces act the same way. They both weaken as the square of the distance between two objects. Double the distance, and the force goes down by 4. Triple the distance, and it goes down by 9. If you heard about Coulomb's law, which describes the behavior of electric forces, and Newton's law of gravity, which handles, of course, gravity, you can do this yourself. Now, there are some subtleties here. The k variable in the Coulomb equation sets the strength of the electromagnetic force, while the g term sets the strength of gravity. But both of those depend on the units, the unit of electric charge in case of electromagnetism, and mass in the case of gravity. We can see what that means by looking at the ratio of the force of gravity and electromagnetism between two identical particles. We take the two equations, take the ratio, and we find that the ratio between gravity and electromagnetism doesn't depend on distance. It's the same everywhere. What matters is the charge to mass ratio, and this isn't a constant. For example, take the electron and the proton. They have the same amount of charge, but different mass. So, for two electrons, gravity is 4.2 times 10 to the 42 power times weaker, but for two protons, gravity is only 1.2 times 10 to the 36 times weaker.
The second is nearly three and a half million times bigger than the first. And that's how one compares gravity and electromagnetism. The strong force is different. For example, its strength has a very different dependence on distance. If two objects that are capable of experiencing the strong force are very close to one another, they feel very little force between them. However, when they get about a femtometer apart, which is about the size of a proton, the force gets stronger, rising to about 10,000 newtons, or a bit over a ton for my American viewers. The weird thing is that the force doesn't change as the particles get farther apart. It's basically constant. But, like when you stretch a rubber band, the energy does increase. Once the two particles are separated by a distance of several times the size of a proton, there's so much energy stored that the energy converts into matter, making new particles. These new particles arrange themselves so the original particles no longer feel any force between them. So, for the strong force, for very short distances, the force is zero. For biggish distances, the force is also zero. But for the distance range of about the size of a proton to a few protons, the force is super strong. Okay, that's gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong nuclear force. What about the weak nuclear force? Well, here, other factors matter. A different factor comes into play. At the quantum level, Forces are created by force-carrying particles jumping between two matter particles. That's known to be true for electromagnetism and the strong and weak forces, and it's thought to be true for gravity. For electromagnetism, gravity, and the strong force, the force-carrying particle is massless. But for the weak force, those force-carrying particles are heavy, very heavy. Each one weighs nearly 100 times as much of a proton, which is approaching 100 billion electron volts, and that changes everything. In fact, for most nuclear decays, the energies involved are about 1 million electron volts. Don't sweat the units, just remember that most radioactive decay involves one, and in those units, the weak force particles would weigh in at about 100,000. Since the energy of nuclear decay is way too small to make weak force particle, you'd think that weak force interactions wouldn't occur. However, quantum mechanics comes into play here. While the mass of weak force particles are, on average, about 100,000, those particles actually have a range of masses. You can see the range here. Where the curve is high, lots of those particles exist. Where the curve is low, very few do. And we see that while the number that exists down at one are very small, they're not zero. However, the farther from normal they are, the shorter amount of time they can exist. This is straight up consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says the lifetime of a thing, which is delta t, times the distance in energy from normal, which is delta e, has to be greater than this constant called the reduced Planck constant, or h-bar, divided by two. If you put in the numbers, you find that the weak force-carrying particles can only exist for a very short time. In fact, they can only live long enough to travel no longer than the distance about one one-thousandth the size of a proton. So this tells us something. The weak force is weak because it's rare. Two objects have to be closer than one one-thousandth the size of the proton for the weak force to come into play in nuclear physics interactions. Below that size, the weak force is relatively strong, and it's all because of the mass of the force-carrying particles of the weak force. If this big mass wasn't a factor, the weak force and the electromagnetic force are pretty similar in strength. One final topic I want to mention is the decay of top quarks. Top quarks are the heaviest known subatomic particle. They decay 100% of the time into bottom quarks and a weak force particle. That's just what they do. As it happens, it takes about 10 to the minus 23 seconds for the strong force to have time to come into play. However, the top quark decays in the staggeringly short 5 times 10 to the minus 25 seconds, or about 5% the time it takes for the strong force to do something. This means that in the case of the decay of the top quark, the weak force happens faster than the strong force. So weak is strong and strong is weak, or something like that. So what's going on? It's because the mass of the top quark is ginormous. It's more than twice as big as the mass of the weak force particle involved in the decay. So the huge mass of the weak force particle isn't an obstacle at all. 
It's like someone wanting to spend $500. If you're a poor college student, 500 bucks is an entire month's food budget, maybe more. So spending it is a big deal. On the other hand, if you're a multimillionaire, you can drop that kind of money on a single bottle of 2002 Cristal. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that the simple hierarchy of forces you learn about in popular science books and many videos, including mine, are just the tip of the iceberg. It's not enough to know how the forces act at a particular distance and energy. A deeper understanding means that you need to understand how they behave under a variety of conditions. And once you fall into that rabbit hole, you find that it's a long way down. Okay, that was a much deeper dive into some of the behavior of forces that you get in most popular science treatments. Even this video only scratches the surface. What did you think? Do you want more deep dives, or should we broaden the subject matter we cover? Let us know your thoughts in the comments, and we'll take them into account as we talk about future programming choices. And, of course, we hope you'll subscribe to the channel. The more, the merrier. As we build our viewership, you'll encounter more people who think like we do. Good people. You know, the kind of people who realize that physics is everything.